Welcome to the Energizing America podcast, where we talk all things business, energy, and people, and why we need it in our communities and business. Enjoy this episode. You will not want to miss it. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon to discuss the very important topic of a changing cost environment and its impact on oil producers and the service companies that work with them. Let's get right into this. We're going to be discussing a few topics this afternoon. We'll be talking a little bit about the history, industry challenges, producers' needs, contractor challenges, cost changes. Do the dreaded talk, and hopefully we'll leave here and stay energized. Diving right into our topic about costs. Yes, even cost has a history. And the history of the cost when it comes to service providers in the oil field is a bit interesting. Every cost starts with the basic idea of there's a demand for some sort of a service. And then that cost is impacted by how much supply is out there. And that equals what the price ultimately ends up being. And so when we talk about contractor costs in the oil field specifically, you know, there was back when oil was first discovered, there was a large demand for the oil, but the supply was limited. So therefore, the price of a barrel of oil was high, but the contract price was actually quite low. And that is because the demand of skilled workforce was not as high as it is today. We had a lot more people in the skilled workforce and this, therefore the supply was greater and the price that those folks could get was less. As things have evolved in our country, the demand for skilled workforce has only increased because we need these goods and services, but the supply of those skilled workers has decreased and thereby the price has increased. So yes, even costs have a history. When we talk about our industry and the challenges, the oil field constantly has to be out doing discovery. They, the fields that there are out there continue to be depleted and there's not tons of new discovery that happens, especially within the United States of America. We have had a shell revolution, and there's a lot of folks who played a big part in that, including folks like Slauson and Continental and others in the Bakken back in 2000, in the early 2000s. And through that shell revolution, we were able to use the same technology down in the Permian Basin and across other basins in the U.S. to actually get more of the oil that we already knew was out there. The production challenge for our producers includes weather-related challenges, price-related challenges, workforce challenges, the view of how much supply is out there and what the corresponding demand is. Our producers are especially challenged with the ability to ramp up production and ramp down production as needed. The ESG pressures that our producers are facing is the like of has not been seen. Since oil was first discovered, especially in the shell plays, we have figured out how to get the production taken care of. We work for some producers who, with the same amount of staff, have been able to quadruple their production while maintaining their costs very easy. When it comes to ESG, however, we enter uncharted territory. Environmental, social, and governance policies have taken on a whole new meaning within our producers. In these offices, they're being told by capital investors that the capital investment is now getting dried up because possibly the investment company has a policy against investing in oil and gas. So not only are producers challenged with keeping up with the environmental regulations, which adds added cost, but they have the combined pressures of society or the social impact and view of oil and gas and the overall fossil fuels. There are other uncharted territories for industry, including governance, where we're putting more emphasis on a more diverse workforce, including women in leadership and a more minority workforce inclusion. That particular element of the ESG is not something that's uncharted for us as much because this industry by sheer nature has attracted those kinds of folks. The folks who are attracted to that to this industry are those people who embrace such challenges. In the Permian Basin, you see a lot of diverse workforce. 
And socially, they're doing great. They're making good wages and they're doing good things for their family. But we haven't seen a whole society turn and put such emphasis on ESG to the point of based on opinion and or policy, they simply will not invest in the industry. So how do we keep the discovery and the cost of discovery while at the same time keeping the production and the cost of production going when investment is drying up around us? And that is really where the ESG policies of especially 2020, 2021, and even into 2022 really impacted our industry in a very negative way, in a, in a very challenging way. We do see some of those challenges easing because weird things happen when people get cold and when their energy bills get really high. The ESG all of a sudden becomes a little bit different twist. And even within our producers, we are seeing a different view on what the word ESG means. We have seen several CEOs of our production companies, major big oil companies coming out in the last two weeks and putting a whole new spin on what it means to have an ESG policy. And we're seeing a lot more fairness doctrine put into this and how it's everyone has a right to affordable, good, clean energy. Moving away from industry challenges, the producers, despite all those challenges, they have some real needs. They need, they need to remain flexible. They need to remain consistent. They need to remain innovative. And they have to have shareholder returns. So at Westcom, as we've worked with our clients and our prospective clients and have attended conferences over the next or over the last several months and over the last couple of years since the pandemic, we're hearing that we are working for folks who have to be flexible. These producers have to be able to move their drill rigs quickly based on what permits get approved, oftentimes what feels like on a whim, or what, what permits get pulled, or what environmental regulation has now been put into place in a new area, causing them to have to make a change to their plans. So they need contractors who are working in a flexible way with them. They also do need to remain consistent. There's one thing about oil and gas is it's always needed. And they have a consistent amount of production that they have either hedged on the futures market, and they have also made pretty deep commitments to their market that they will have the oil and gas out there. So despite all the headwinds of having to be flexible and make all these fast moving changes, we still have to remain consistent and get this product to market. We're also hearing a lot from our producers and our potential producers about innovation. You know, the oil and gas market is thought of as something that's stuck in the mud or hasn't changed much over the last 20, 30, 40, even 50 years. But the amount of innovation that's been in the oil and gas industry, especially in the last two years since COVID, has been remarkable. We're seeing in North Dakota that 40 drill rigs can do the e equivalent amount of work as what used to be 160 drill rigs. We're seeing in, in New Mexico that a, a well can be drilled in a matter of 10 days versus 34 days that it used to take. We're seeing that we can get more wells on one pad and thereby reduce the overall footprint. But innovation doesn't just stop at the drilling side. We're seeing automation becoming a huge piece in the oil and gas industry, where companies are realizing a huge benefit in making an investment that allow them to be in a control room rather than out on a location to determine how much flow they need. It's pretty remarkable to be remarkable to be on a location up in northern Minnesota or in southern Michigan and actually be getting a phone call from a control room in Houston wondering why the gas just decreased in supply. So those types of innovation things are not stopping. And every meeting that we find ourselves in, folks are asking, what are we doing about innovation? And how are we training our guys? And where are we pulling those people from? And what kind of idea generations do we have to help them out? The final thing that the producers are really focused on, like we've never seen before, is a return to their shareholders. And while there's a lot of folks in today's environment who may think that that's a crazy way to be or a terrible thing to think about, I challenge everyone to think about their investments that they make. I have never met a single person who's willing to make an investment in something with no return. Now, the return isn't always financial, but generally speaking, it has a financial component. 
the oil and gas industry over the last 10 years has had a negative return to their shareholders. So have there been profitable years in the oil industry? Yes, there has. But have those profitable years been sufficient enough to make up for the amount of capital that's required? No. And therefore, the, produce, the producers have been told by their shareholders, by the price of their stock, that if you don't change your ways, we're going to stop investing in you. So you have this colliding factor of increased ESG pressure and major investment firms saying we're no longer going to invest in you because of the word fossil fuels, combined with other investment firms saying we're tired of investing in you and not seeing a return on our investment. So our producers are heavily focused on free cash flow, variable dividends. How do we get money back to the shareholders for their investment in our company. What does that all mean for us contractors? Well, I think all of us can agree this has been a challenging time for us. We have significant challenges just by the sheer name contractor. It's made further challenging in this industry because we have a severe skilled workforce shortage. That same challenge that's on the producer's end, we're filling at tenfold. We're looked to, to to be the ones who go get the hire and to get them trained up and put them to work and take care of what the producer needs. Anyone who's in the trades knows that this has been a problem brewing for a long time. And we really feel like it's going to take a while for us to figure out a good solution. We're seeing some good signs on the horizon about folks wanting to come back into the oil field and folks wanting to get into the trade school. We're even seeing high schools willing to make investments in trade schools, and the education system is starting to be okay with not mandating that everyone goes to college. So we're excited about where the skilled workforce is headed, but we're acknowledged that it is in a very, very tough spot. In the oil and gas industry, we're further challenged as contractors because of the locations of our work. You know, we talked a little bit about the discovery of oil, and for some reason, we can't discover oil in huge, large cities. And I feel like if we did, we wouldn't get the all clear to go ahead and drill. So not only do we have to find these skilled work workers, but then we have to convince them to oftentimes leave their families, leave their homes, leave the people that they grew up with in the high school sports that they played in and all the communities that they know and come out to the Bakken Shell Play of North Dakota or down to the Permian Shell Play of New Mexico. And when they get there, they're dealing with some pretty tough conditions. Over in North Dakota, you've got 50 mile an hour winds and oftentimes the temperatures are at a base temp of 10. So you combine those two elements and you're working in 20 below weather. Down in Carlsbad, there's times when I've been there working and it's 110 degrees and you have your full FR gear suited up. There's a lot of issues with those remote locations. There's ways to overcome those challenges, but it is a big challenge for us contractors. Additionally, there's a lot of social pressure on contractors just like there is on our producers. It turns out that nobody likes working in an in a environment that is shunned. And so when we've done some surveys with our team at Westcom, some of the feedback that we've gotten is they really like when they're working for a contractor who's known in the community, who gives back to the community and has just an overall good vibe. How do you, how do you maintain that good vibe that a contractor wants in order to attract and retain these employees when at the same time, just the sheer name of fossil fuel. If you have that word oil or that word, word gas in your business name, provides additional social pressure to the employees that you so value. And the final thing about the oil and gas contractor specific challenge that we all know we deal with is stability. The oil and gas market historically has not been a stable environment. I've been in the business for almost 10 years and during those 10 years, I've went from five employees to 200 and you name the date and I've been anywhere in between there. It is the exact opposite of stability. So a contractor has to be extremely focused on the little things that we can do to help iron out that ups and downs. There's ideas on how we can become more stable, and we need to bring these challenges of the skilled workforce, the remote locations, the social pressures, and the stability all to our producers and have real frank conversations 
about how collectively we can solve this. And some of these things, including stability, I do think we can do better with. Regarding cost changes, the whole point for us to get together today, the annual inflation rate in the US has slowed for the third month in a row, but we're still at 8.2% in September. And this is according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And there's always the devil in the details. We're such a headline reading society that oftentimes we just say, well, inflation is up 8.2%. My rates better go up 8.2%. But folks, details matter. And in this statistic, possibly more than any other stat that you could find, behind that 8.2 inflation number, there's a makeup of various sectors of our economy that's impacting that 8.2% inflation rate. Our energy mix is up 19.8%. And by the way, this is the highest it's been since 1982. So we're in unprecedented territory, inexperienced territory for most of us. Gasoline is up 18.2%, fuel oil up 58%, even electricity is up 15%. So the food and energy, which is the number one consuming product that our consumers are using, all of our friends and neighbors and family, they're impacted greatly by that. So while inflation is, maybe you could even say only 8.2%, even though that's high, you have to think about what that core rate, that 6.6% of 6.6% just in food and energy, which is the top expense for most folks behind housing. To give you a couple ideas what that actually means, I went on to the uh, CPI index, which is a government-ran uh, index, and anyone can go to cpi.org and you can type in uh, the price of something, you select the year, and then it'll convert it to what it was in today's dollars. And I was kind of fascinated by this because we see a current administration and a current society that talks about the gas and oil producers, the gas stations, that they're charging too much. And they don't realize that those folks are actually price takers. Our industry is not a price maker. We don't produce a bunch of product that we can then put on the, on the local shelf and, and demand a certain price for it. And if it doesn't sell, we just leave it there. No, that's quite opposite in the oil and gas industry. Whatever we produce gets consumed almost immediately. So we become price takers. Whatever the market is willing to pay us, we'll take it. And by the way, that even includes in April of 2020 taking a negative $27.90 a barrel. But to give you an idea, in August of 1982, following this, or September of 1982, following the same deal when inflation was measured, gas was $1.31 in, in September of 1982. That same $1.31, today's dollars, is $3.97. I saw fuel down the road this morning at $3.58. So I think the gas station has actually got some room to go. And then I thought, well, what's the price of a barrel of oil? $31.83 in 1982, converted to today's dollars using the government stated websites, which tracks the movement of inflation, and it would be $96.50. Today's price of a barrel of oil is just over $84 when I checked earlier. So I think that gas and oil, we like to blame a lot of things about it and say that they're making up prices and they're charging us too much. But folks, if you're willing to pay 6.6% more or 8.2% for other things, why would oil and gas have any difference there? And in fact, I think we've done quite well given the circumstances. What does that mean actually though, at the end of the day, as a contractor who's trying to spin the wheel and make some money? Well, you gotta determine your costs. When Westcom entered this unchartered territory and especially towards the end of 2021 and into 2022, it became evident we were gonna to have to have some very tough conversations. So we looked into what is actually changing. I don't care if inflation is up 8% or 90%. If inflation is up 90%, but it only impacts me by 10%, I have to know that information. And unfortunately, contractors, this is where we're not good. We're not good at doing these kinds of calculations and this kind of math. But you've got to determine what your costs are and how those are changing and what's impacting them. At Westcom, there was a few big ones for us. And I, in conversation with other producers or other service companies, these are pretty common. Most of us have some serious fuel bills. 
I know at Westcom that, you know, it's it's tens of thousands of dollars to get our trucks and our crews from one location to the next each day. When we talk about fuel, though, and we talk about costs, we could talk about, yeah, well, Westcom used to spend $40,000 on fuel and now they're spending seventy, so we need to double our rates. Not true. You got to know what, what is actually driving that individual price. And the reason why that's important is because possibly your business has increased or decreased in size. So at Westcom, if we've increased our crews and we have more trucks all the time, we can't just say that our fuel cost is more because we have more trucks. We actually got to figure out what is that? In our specific case, we figured out that our fuel is impacted by how many hours we're working. How many hours is the crew out and about? So, and then how many miles do we drive? So we figured out how much per mile and how much per hour is our fuel gone up? Not per vehicle, because that doesn't even matter for us or, or in total. We had to dumb it down and get to that specific widget. We're, we're impacted by power bills and other energy costs. Believe it or not, our employees would like to have wage increases, especially when they're experiencing record high inflation. And then the one thing that was really surprising for us and in, in, in further conversations with others, it doesn't take much to get here or, or really it just shows our my specific ignorance to what makes up a cost. But the amount of money you have to spend to maintain your capital when in a rising cost environment, especially as service providers in the oil industry, you don't see very many Teslas or very many small uh Volkswagen bugs out driving in the oil field. You see F-150s and, and 1,500 pickups, right? If not one tons. And so those trucks are bouncing down those lease roads and they burn through some tires pretty quickly and often. What used to cost $1,200 and instead of in four tires for our trucks is now costing $2,000. And by the way, that's if, we, if we're very careful about which tires we're purchasing and have a good vendor agreement in place. So it's not just fuel that's impacted and it's not just food. It's even the tires of your vehicles. So now that we've figured out, well, what has changed in our cost? Where do we go from here? We actually put that into what is, we call is our rate makeup. If we're charging for easy math, $100 an hour per average per guy, what is actually making up that rate? And so is 10% of it fuel related and fuels up 50%? Well, that 10% needs to increase 50%. We went through that whole exercise and determined what that rate makeup was previously, what it is now, and therefore what our new rate needed to be. And that's when we hit the panic button. And I think if we hadn't actually went through this exercise to know exactly what our rate was made up of and how that has changed, I don't know if we could have ever imagined what our rate really needed to be. But we didn't just panic. We moved into action, and this is where we all need to be paying attention as service providers. I call it the dreaded talk, primarily because the one thing that I hate about being a business owner and a CEO is the conversation about rates. However, this year I've learned a couple of things, and that is that there's a reality that's staring at us in the face. We need to know what our costs are, what their makeup is, and what that corresponding charge needs to be to the client. And then with it, we also need to acknowledge that we have to do things better. Not every single cost increase can be passed off to a client. Some cost increases are because we're not doing the right thing. For instance, you, you notice I didn't talk about small tools. Maybe the cost of a drill is up slightly, but in our analysis, we didn't see a huge cost increase in tools. Well, if we're increasing our cost in tools, that's not because of our producer. It might be that we don't have a good tool management practice in place. So acknowledging those things that you need to do better is a very important piece of this conversation. Once you have those two things in place, that you're confident that you've done you, whatever you can to do things better and you know what your costs are, that's when you can move forward and do some implementation. My experience was open and candid conversation with a quick response was how we won. And the, what I mean by open is I shared the information with our producers. I'm not hiding. So, hey, Mr. Producer, my fuel costs on average per mile are up 22%. And that makes up 10% of my rate. 
hey, Mr. Producer, my wages are up about 8% year over year, and that makes up 60% of my rate. And by the way, when you have that open conversation, your producer, when they're hearing it, they're making it, that's right, we have the same thing. That's right, my wages went up 8%. That's right, when I fill my fuel tank, it's up a few, you know, 40% or whatever the numbers are. But then we have to have be very candid about it. Conversation without candidness doesn't get very far. So in our experience, we had to relate it as to what that actually means for our producers that, okay, here's an open conversation, our costs are up. The candid piece of the conversation is, I have to pass that cost along. And the response quickly is, I need to do this effective within a month, within two weeks, within 60 days, within the whatever MSA or whatever contractual obligations allow. And the reason why that quick response is necessary is because we all know that our producers are extremely good at responding very quickly to us when the price of a barrel decreases. My challenge to anyone on the LinkedIn event or listens to the recording of it is to go find a producer that when oil was headed into negative territory or go find a, a service contractor that did not receive a phone call, an email, or some other method of communication from their producer telling them to immediately decrease prices. We need to respond quickly to an increase just like we do to a decrease, especially when our costs are so heavily impacted by such increase. We move from the reality to the implementation to the digging in. What we have realized is, while our federal government and different reports are coming out, they're talking about inflation stabilizing and coming back down, we're still at 8.2%. We're not done. So we got to keep reviewing this and keep the conversation going. Having check-ins with our clients, asking them how they're doing with their rates, opening up that conversation. And then oftentimes they ask us, well, how are you doing? It turns out they want us to be successful because the industry challenges we talked about and the producer needs that we visited about, those are very, very real. And they're only taken care of through the use of contract labor and contractor services. So if they have that conversation with you, they want you to answer. And the other piece of it is, is we really need to get involved as, as service providers. We have seen the producers and our, our oil and gas uh, industry leaders get out and do podcasts. We've seen them do public information campaigns. We've seen them get on the news shows and talk about energy security and energy poverty and what this means to our global and our country. We as service providers need to do our piece. We need to get involved in the communities that we operate in, and we need to get involved in the trade associations. We need to go to the local elementary schools and talk about this. And we don't just talk about it from an opinion standpoint. We talk about it from a factual standpoint, that this is the single easiest way to lift people out of poverty is through solid, stable, affordable energy costs. From here, we have to leave and stay energized. Our country and our world needs us. We've got to leave our egos outside, even if we feel like we need more money or we need less money, whether our costs are high, whether they're low, whether we believe in oil and gas or we believe in renewables. Time to put the egos outside and dig in for the facts and come in with incredible things happen when we go live in somebody else's shoes. I wondered about solar. Where is this going? What is it? What I did is I put solar in my house. And for the last year, I've realized some really cool benefits of solar. But I'll tell you what I also realized, even more so than the benefits of solar, I realized the importance of that oil and gas. Because I'm telling you, in the month of February, I would have froze if we did not have oil and gas. So go put your boots on. And that, that includes, by the way, the, those of us who are leading organizations, we got to get out in the field and experience what our team is feeling because we can start to think, oh, they're just complaining about the cost of everything, but they don't really understand what it's really like. No, you actually don't really understand what it's like to experience those costs. So get out there and put your boots on with them. The other piece we talked about briefly a minute ago is educate. We need to educate our producers about what our cost structure is and what their initiatives that they're implementing cost and how that impacts their uh, resulting rates. For example, 
we all believe heavily in safety. And at Westcom, we take it very serious. The producers who also take it serious via their pocketbook instead of their mouth are the easiest producers to work with and leave in a safe working environment. We need to educate. It's my job when I'm sitting with the safety director at an oil and gas entity to talk about, yes, I agree. You need to have your safety specialist stop out at that construction site and pull our guys aside and talk for an hour. Certainly, you can agree that our guys should be compensated for that hour, and thereby we need to include that in our rates. We need to educate the world around us about the industry that we're in and the challenges that we face every single day. Through that education, even if you only win one person over and they begin to understand you've done your job, and we really, as service providers, we need to seek win-win relationships. The win-win relationships are those producers who not just value you because you're the cheapest, but they value you because you're playing an integral part in their success and in the success of the oil and gas industry going forward. So remember, our industry is challenged. We, we've, had a, we've had quite a history in the oil and gas business, and our costs have a history as well. They've been low, they've been high, they've been everywhere in between. It's, it's based on supply, demand, and what the resulting price is. Our industry is challenged. We're in a tough spot. Financially, we're not getting the backing we used to. The country and the world is putting a lot of pressure on us to do better through ESG and the like. Our producers need folks who understand this and can get the projects done for them and can be flexible and, and can be safe. The contractor, we know that we're challenged by a skilled workforce and some social pressures and some nasty cost increases. So what can we do about those cost increases? Go figure out what your rate is made up of. Talk about the, you know, look at each individual item that impacts that rate, figure out the change, and then go have that open, candid, urgent conversation that you need to have with your producer. And if you do that and through it, you understand the difficulty that your producer is also faced with, you will have that dreaded talk will become an easy talk and one you actually start looking forward to. And finally, if you do all of that, you'll stay energized and we'll continue to do our part as service providers to ensure that our producers are pulling that much needed oil and gas out of the ground to make sure that our country and our world can stay warm and stay energized this year. I invite anyone with any comments or questions about the presentation or anyone who would wish to hear more about Westcom specifically to reach out to me or anyone on our team uh, via LinkedIn. And we'll be happy to set up a one-on-one -on -one with you. And even if you're wondering, how did you actually do that on your rates and additional conversations around that? This is a very open company and we love to talk with our peers in the industry so that we can all leave this industry in a better spot than we found it. With that, I thank you for your time.